I'm Teresa Caraggio, and this is Third Paradigm. My topic today is from a book I was once drafting called A House for the Soul in the Land Beyond Faith. And it was prompted because one of my favorite Substack writers, Kathleen Devaney, put out a post called Faith and Religion, and it was from an outline of a book that she had once drafted called Freeing God from Religion. So I would love to continue this conversation because I think there's a real interaction between our two ideas. Let's do this. I find Substack to be an exciting medium because the comment threads allow for real conversations. And I think the most powerful force in the universe is two people who are asking the same question, where your focus is on, let's figure this out together rather than who's winning. And in that, I think one of the most important things is to define your terms. And it doesn't mean that either person wins in terms of who has the real definition, but in order for a conversation about concepts to happen, you have to know what the other person means by that term. Because all words are fossilized metaphors. And once you take a concept and put it into a word, you have to be able to go back to that concept in order for that to have any meaning. And one of the tricks I think that they've used to confuse us is to make sure that the words that we have for important concepts like sovereignty no longer have that meaning. So in this case, I've been talking with, say, Nefahotep about the definitions of wealth and money. And I have every confidence that he and I completely agree on what we're trying to achieve and the means by which we want to do that. But we have different definitions for those words. With Kathleen, faith and religion are words that I think I define differently, but I know that Kathleen and I share the same goal. So I think that that's the place to start. Kathleen's premise, as I understand it, and I will link this in the substack so that you can compare, is that faith is that intuitive individual sense of the divine, and that we each have that experience of divinity, and that everything would be fine if we were only dealing with our individual faith. But where the problems come in is religion is that religion is an expression of that faith. And it's a particular expression that then becomes dogma. And that's why wars are fought over those individual expressions that then become dogma. In my book, A House for the Soul and the Land Beyond Faith, I define that differently. I look at faith the same as belief as making up your mind about something in advance of your own experience of it or the facts. And so I don't believe in believing. I think that if you have knowledge, you don't need belief. And that belief and faith are things that block knowledge because they don't allow you to raise certain things to question. They become dogmas. What I think that religion should be is a forum for asking the big questions. What it is, is a place in which they give you the answers and there are no questions allowed. And I know because I've looked for that kind of forum and it doesn't exist. What are the big questions? The first and most essential is what is my true relationship to you? Is it hierarchical? Or is it equal? If it's hierarchical, then I have all of those religions that are cults of superiority that I can choose from. But if I see my relationship to you as equal, then I have to reject those religions because all of them kick my dogma. And my only dogma is that I am equal to you. All cults of superiority, whether they involve a billion people or two, work the same way. And so religions work the same way as that spiritual pickup artist that I talked about in To Love Me Is To Know Me. In that, he started with flattery. You are superior to other people. You're so spiritual. And 
in that there was the, okay, but you need to recognize my superiority to you. And if I didn't and challenge that, then I became someone who was no longer part of the cult. And that's when cold hatred, which is that shared superiority, turns into hot hatred. And that's how every religion works. What a priest or a rabbi or anyone does is say, okay, I'm superior to you and you need to recognize my authority. But in exchange, what I'm giving you is that you're superior to all of them who are not like us. And that's what I believe we have to reject. That's what's made religions like Judaism morally bankrupt in their treatment of 20,000 Palestinians who have been killed. They are the other. They are not under that same moral code. And that's what's made Christianity morally bankrupt in the Crusades, in colonization, in slavery, in the Inquisitions, in the entire history of the domination of the world with the Holy Roman Empire. Both of those have a moral code that have enabled that sort of thing. That a sociology text that I quote in my book said, first came the soldiers and then the friars, and it is hard to say who did more damage. What Kathleen calls faith, I think A Course in Miracles would call revelation. It's a direct experience that is intensely personal of the divine. And it's something that gives you courage. It gives you conviction. And you have that knowledge that doesn't last, but you remember that you felt that way. But it's not interpersonal. And so it can't really be communicated or transferred. And that's where it sees the miracle as coming in, that the miracle is interpersonal. It's when you act on that conviction, that sense of, yeah, you know, things are not the way that they seem. You and I are really connected. We both are looking for the same thing. And when you give other people that credit, there are things that happen that in terms of the timing, I think cannot be explained logically. And that's the interpersonal recognition that things are not as they seem. I've had some experiences of revelation, particularly at a hermitage in Big Sur that used to be my vortex, someplace that it seems like things sped up and happen more quickly. I remember being there once when my daughters were very young and I had photographs of them set up in a little enclave along with a little votive candle. And I asked for a sign and all of those photographs suddenly fell and rippled and terrified me because it seemed like such an ominous sign. And later I explained it to myself as that candle creating some kind of difference in the wind tunnels. But who knows? That was something that made me think, okay, there's something at work here. And at the same hermitage, I remember I was reading Martin Buber and studying his I and thou, and I decided to say thou as deeply as I could to the ocean. And suddenly, it just froze. It froze in its churn against a rock, and I found I could let it go, and I could cause it to freeze again. And when I came back down off of that mountain, I had the conviction that I could have driven straight off and it would have been fine. But anytime I've shared that story with people, they have said, oh my God, I'm glad you didn't. Where miracles have been more evident in my life hasn't been in terms of what happened, but how and the timing. Where the timing of something will be so bizarre, so eerily prescient, where it just can't be an accident, where this thing happens and then immediately this happens. So it's not so much that there's something that suddenly makes everything better, but there's a sense of the timing that says there is something at work here. It is not just chance. There is some force that's in control 
because this timing is too strange to just be an accident. Some people have seen me as rejecting the concept of God, but that's exactly the opposite. Within a dogma that we are all separate, and that's the only way in which you being superior is possible. Is that it has to start out with a dogma that you and I are separate, separate souls, separate minds, encased in separate bodies, existing in the world. And what my belief does is reverse that and say there's a possibility that the world exists in our mind because our minds aren't necessarily separate. And that's not a belief of mine, but it is a possibility that I entertain. And that makes the possibility of a God who is ethical, who is moral, to actually exist because that God could not interfere with our bubble of dream or whatever this world is. If that's not real, God can't intervene. God can only, through spirit, influence through things like the timing and the circumstances. So those are things that I think are under the control of spirit. But if you have a dogma that your identity is your religion, then what you have to do is retrofit God into that dogma of superiority. Like you have to take the world the way that you see it, in which some get everything, others get nothing, it's extremely unfair, and then you have to reverse engineer a God who would be doing that. And it would be doing that because, well, some people are just better than others. Some people are luckier than others. And that's something that God wills because otherwise God could and has intervened. This doesn't need to be a religion that even has a concept of God in order to have a concept of superiority. All it needs to do is take as dogma the fact that the world of your senses exists. Things are what you see, and therefore they cannot be questioned. In my recent critiques of Judaism, I've had some people who have been enthusiastically on board only because they want to show that Christianity is better. And so, again, that's another cult of superiority. And then I've had others who are willing to trash both of those, but who were not happy when I kicked their dogma of Buddhism and their favorite teacher. And so I think that you have to be consistent. You have to be consistent in saying, if we are equal, then we are only criticizing ideas. And we're not saying that anyone out there has the answers that we don't have. We have to be comparing answers. I think we need that forum where we're all running our different experiments in terms of what's true and what's real and comparing notes. But as soon as you introduce a teacher into that who's supposed to have the answers, I think that's defeated the purpose. To build our house for the soul in that land beyond faith, I think we do need community. We need to have those conversations where we're asking the questions together, those big questions. And we're running our own experiments and we're comparing notes with others. And the only thing that we are judging them on is whether they show superiority, whether there are those little corners where we say, mm, the only thing that's going to save me is me being better than somebody else, because clearly we can't save everybody. We can only save everybody. Let's do that. And to follow up, here is Ideology is Everything, which is also about myths of superiority in religion, politics, and mass formation, and also mysticism and economics. Thank you for watching.